I was brought up by a typographic father. He was a compositor. The garage never housed a car, but we had four printing presses. And as a child, I would hear and watch my father print. And at home, he had two or three books that had been printed by Baskerville, which he would show me, point out the characteristics. And it was at that point, really, as a 14-year-old, that I started to become interested in Baskerville, to fall in love with his work. And as I grew up and my career developed, I became more and more interested in him. Baskerville was born in 1707 in a village called Wolverley in Worcestershire. We don't know very much about his upbringing. We don't even know anything about his schooling. But at some point, Baskerville left Wolverley for the bright lights of Birmingham. He started to work as a writing master. And from a writing master, he became a cutter of letters for headstones. Baskerville always wanted to be rich and teaching handwriting and cutting headstones wasn't going to make him wealthy. So he turned his attention to a new process which was called Japanning, which was making household goods out of tin which were decorated and lacquered. And from this he made a fortune. And that fortune allowed him to build himself a very large house in the centre of Birmingham where the Library of Birmingham now stands. And it was on the proceeds of his Japanning business that he was able to return to his first love, which was letters. But rather than going back to simply teaching handwriting or cutting headstones, because Baskerville was a great technocrat, he wanted to marry his love of letters with the great technology of his day, which was printing. The work we're undertaking in collaboration with the University of Cambridge and Birmingham City University hopes to find out about the Baskerville punches, how they were made, what they were made from and who made them. To understand a bit more about what punches are and what they do, we met with Colin Clarkson, Head of Modern Research Collections in the University Library, Cambridge. The first stage in translating the designer's two-dimensional letter form into three-dimensional type was to manufacture a punch. This was done by taking a, a rod of steel and carving the end of the rod into the shape of the required character. The next stage was to take a, a piece of a softer metal, typically copper, place the punch against the, the copper, hit it with a hammer, driving it into the surface of the softer metal, leaving an impression of the character which was to be cast. This is called the matrix. Then insert the matrix into a mould where it was hold in, held in place by a spring. He would then take a ladle of molten type metal, which is an alloy of lead, tin and antimony, and pour it into the funnel in the top of his mould. This would leave him with a, a cast looking like this, where you've got the, the metal which is set in the funnel here, called the jet, and at the other end a piece of type. Uh, the jet would be broken off and the sides and base of the piece of type would be smoothed off so that it all fitted snugly together when it was set. The typecaster would make as many copies of each piece of type as were required and the type would then be distributed into wooden cases ready for the compositor who, working from the author's manuscript, set the type ready to print the text. As Baskerville himself wrote, Having been an earlier admirer of the beauty of letters, I became insensibly desirous of contributing to the perfection of them. I formed to myself ideas of greater accuracy than yet had appeared, and had endeavoured to produce a set of types according to what I conceived to be their true proportions. So whilst we know Baskerville cut some of his own punches with his own hands, we know he didn't work in isolation. He employed John Handy, a local punch cutter, to assist him with his task. But he probably also employed the services of Birmingham's engravers. And it's their skills that he adopted and were applied to the cutting of his punches, which are meticulously made. 
My name's Liam Sims and I'm one of the rare book specialists here in Cambridge University Library and I help to share the historic collections that we have in the library with all sorts of different people. The Baskerville material is part of that. It's a really rare thing to have a direct link back to an 18th century printer. Obviously we have a lot of 18th century books in this library but you don't often, you just have the book, you know, you don't have uh, the, the material that made it. Um, and in this case it gives us a real connection back to Baskerville um, and it shows us exactly what his intention was in designing his type. Baskerville really wanted to, to print the Bible. To do that in the 18th century you had to have special permission because people didn't want errors to creep in and so there were authorised printers in London and the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. Baskerville had to be chosen by the, the syndics of the university press who were the people who controlled its affairs. They had to vote for him to be the printer. Samuel Halifax chooseth John Baskerville to be one of the stationers and printers for the term of ten years next to come, and on the conditions already agreed upon between the university and him. In coming to, to Cambridge, Baskerville was able to realise this dream and print this Bible. So Baskerville's process of composition was very different to that of his contemporaries. He allowed more space between the lines, greater margins in his books, to give his pages a fresh, clean and airy approach which made them far more legible. So how many Baskerville Bibles do you have in the library? Uh, so this is one of three copies of, of this edition uh, of, the, of the Bible that Baskerville printed. Looking at the title page, it's very typical Baskerville. Mm -hmm. He's stripped it of virtually all decoration, with yep. the exception of the decoration here, his star and lozenge. Yep. And you've got the title, the Holy Bible, and these parts uh, have been engraved rather than printed with metal type, and they've got these flourishes yes. around them, so very minimal yes. decoration. And very different to his own typeface with the engraved bit. You can really see the sort of shape of a pen nib mm. there, whereas this is very much typographic. Yeah, yeah. Baskerville didn't just print the Bible, he had to wait until he had sufficient subscribers and therefore guaranteed income before he would embark upon the process of printing. Mm. And we have a couple of pages of listing those early subscribers here. Yeah, it's, it's a real kind of range of different names. So you've got booksellers who were buying multiple copies that they could then sell on. You've got the important people in capital letters. There are lots of people in Cambridge, obviously, because, because it was printed here, and, and people in Birmingham as well. Yes, we've got the industrialist Matthew Bolton. Matthew Bolton was a, a younger man than Baskerville, but the two of them were friends and collaborated together, and I think Baskerville even lent Bolton some money to set up mm. his factory. Mm. Um, so you can see Baskerville's relationships with the people in Birmingham yeah. through the subscribers list. Yeah, and you can see that the, the ink is, is very bright, isn't it? It's, it's yes. kind of shining almost on the, on the paper. Baskerville liked shiny things, which I think stems from his role as a japanner mm. uh, and producing shiny goods. He brings that into his printing. He, he developed a process for, um, for pressing his paper um, to make it flat and smooth and shiny, just like his Japan way, really. Baskerville's ink was considered to be blacker, shinier, richer than the inks used by any other printer in the 18th century. We know from analysis now of some of his ink that the pigments that he used were those that he had also used in his Japan ware to manufacture the paints and the gloss. Again, he transferred technology from one industry into his new industry, printing. While we're here at the University of Cambridge, we are concentrating on actually scanning the data and scanning as many of the punches as possible. Also, by splicing them with digital photographic imagery, we will be able to make 3D models that we can rotate and look at from all angles. We'll then be able to make 3D prints of the data. 3D print really serves to give people a sense of scale and obviously it's in a format that then can be handled which the original punches can't. The punches we've been looking at have ranged from 60 points down to 14 points. 
what might appear to be a scratch or a dent or an undulation on the surface, it's actually a tool mark and they give you some indication of the processes that were applied to this steel in order to create the punch in the first place. My name is Maciej Pawlikowski, head of Digital Content Unit. This is the unit which exists in the library mainly does the digitization of the archival material. The technology we decided to work on Baskerville project with is called Reflectance Transformation Imaging. This is the type of photogrammetry, so it's a technology which uses multiple images of the same scene. What we've learned from the sample images so far is that there are lines in the texture which are showing the eye use of those punches, how the edges of the punch, of the metal, were off all the time as well. It shows us all the imperfections and as well it shows us this, the ideal design, the concept behind creating the typography in the first place and those nuances which can get lost in translation from one medium to another in the process of creating the actual print. And I think that's one of the most fascinating parts of it because I'm extremely excited about the translating anything from analog to digital back and forth and what kind of qualities we can achieve with it and what kind of qualities we can lose with it. It's a bit about showing something which cannot be seen otherwise. So after three successful days of working with the punchers in Cambridge, Liam's now brought the punchers up to Birmingham Assay Office for analysis. It's the first time the punchers have been brought to Birmingham for 250 years. masses of data from the XRF. The biggest element is the iron, but it's really the trace elements that are the most intriguing. If we can identify patterns in these trace materials over the punches that have been analysed, that acts like a signature. So we might be able to say, ah, oh, they came from this region, or they might have been made at this time because of what's in that trace element. The metals analysis has offered insight into the kind of iron that the punch cutters used. Further analysis of the punches will reveal the trace elements in that iron, which will give us an idea of the provenance and origin of the punches. The experiments are just the beginning and much more work is still required. But importantly, they have already revealed more about Baskerville's working methods than we previously knew. And they have started to extend our knowledge of Baskerville beyond the man and his books. Mm -hmm.